are listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Cowabunga, Explorers. I'm one of your hosts, Dennis, joined by... Johnny Angelo. And... Jake Atello. <laughs> and today, we are totally discussing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin, by writers Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird, Tom Waltz, and artist Kevin Eastman, Esau Escorza, and Isaac Escorza. We hope you have read today's title because all three of us amigos have totally read the book. So beware, spoilers ahead. Explorers can share their opinions and thoughts or pizza with us by leaving a comment on our Facebook page or over on our Twitter and Instagram at Gene Explorers Club. Graphic Novel Explorers Club is available wherever fine podcasts are found, including YouTube. Today, we're taking a look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin, uh, like Dennis said in the introduction, story by Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird, and Tom Waltz, art by Kevin Eastman, Esau Escorza, and Isaac Escorza, and uh, this was a big deal, right? I, I'm not really super familiar with any of the comic books, uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics, but this is a big deal because the, the original creators came back for this, right? Yeah, I think it was part of that that show, The Toys That Made Us on Netflix, which is awesome right in series. Out. Yeah, I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like, oh yeah, I remember all of this. And in doing the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles episode, I believe they they started talking again. I don't know the fallout of their relationship, but considering how much money has probably been generated from the whole Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle franchise, I'm sure it had something to do with, you know, mo money, mo problems. So <laughs> it's, it's good that, that they're, they're back together. Yeah. And honestly, if you read the book, a lot of it really gains inspiration from the cartoon, which is very different from the comic that they started off. And were you guys, I, I don't forget if we discussed this before, but were you guys fans of the Ninja Turtles back in the day? Kind of, I was, uh, Dennis and I are the same age, and Jake, you're what, just two or three years younger than A little than bit us? younger, yeah. I, I was, like, aware of it, and I liked it, but I wasn't really into it, because I think when this came out, I was already, like, 14 or 15 years old, so, like, when the cartoon debuted, right? It was, like, what, 89, 90? No, 87, man. Oh, mm-hmm. really? Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, then... I guess I should have paid more attention back then to it. <laughs> I did play the hell out of the very difficult S- NES game, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That, I would rent that from the uh, grocery store down the street from us. The damn level was like an anxiety attack like in, in Nintendo form. It, it, yeah. was, it was very stressful. I remember like that that leaving a, an imprint on me of like how stressful it was to get, get through that at the end. And this is the days before you could save a game. Oh yeah, no, oh, it was yeah. it was one hit. You had one shot to get all the way through, and and it was the timer at the. It, you had like two minutes and thirty seconds to defuse all the bombs. And even when I got to the last one, I would always stress. I'm like, did I get all of them? And then when I got the, <laughs> you know, the cowbunga animation, I was like, I, I would take a deep breath. <laughs> How about you, Jake? What was your uh, history with the turtles? Uh, I definitely jumped on board with the uh, the cartoon, the the comic books, the original comic books that came out. That was just a little bit too indie for where I was at at that time. I mean, I was still like middle school, and so I remember one time an older friend had the the originals, and I was reading some of it, and I was like, "Wow, like people die in these. This is amazing, you know." <laughs> and, and it was such a contrast from the you know the the cartoon with you know the the comical Krang and you know the Say almost like bumbling shredder. Yeah, totally. I I was introduced to the comic first. I remember distinctly. I think it was a, a store called Comics and Comics in Fairfield, and it was. A, I later found out it was a second reprint, but the cover got me. The cover, in fact, was the one eventually used for the NES game that you guys are talking about. So I had all four Ninja Turtles. They all wore red bandanas around their eyes. They didn't yeah. have distinctive colors, and it was completely black and white comic. And I thought, well, this is kind of weird. It's black and white. I had never seen a black and white comic except for the comic strips before. And yeah, it was very dark and brooding. I didn't realize until much later that it was essentially almost like a parody, a ripoff of Daredevil, the origin story where some ooze almost hits the kid and then it goes into the sewer. And essentially, when it goes into the sewer, it then infects them as as turtles. But yeah, it was much better. That's how the comic started off instead of... uh... 
the daredevil getting splashed in the eyes, it misses and goes down to the sewer well, drain. It, hit, it hits, it hits, suppose it's implied that it hits daredevil in the eyes, so it's like the same universe, but it also goes down into the sewers and infects them. So, mm. and then as opposed to the uh, hand clan, like the yeah, daredevil the was fighting clan. the foot clan, but in, in the comics, they're fully human. They're not robots, which they made them robots in the cartoon because uh, obviously it's easier to kill uh, ninja robots than it is to actually kill human beings for cartoon purposes. Same and, way yeah. that they incorporated the uh, the bat soldiers and GI Joe and exactly in helicopters had parachutes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, and the lasers always hit around the yeah. laser. It was it wasn't bullets; they had laser guns. Which, side note, I was a big fan of the G.I. Joe comic, and it was much more harsh. It dealt with PTSD, people died, oh, really? died. Oh, yeah. It was, it was, there was a lot of heavy material in there. My, my favorite story actually involved a Crimson Guard, and part of their deep cover is they have a fake family, and the fake family knows they're fake. But then they actually found out they actually loved each other, <laughs> and then the guy, like, did everything he could to protect his basically fake son. And it was, like, this really, like, heavy thing you find that a Cobra Commander has a son that he ignored and it, it was like really deep level stuff so I always appreciate huh. that about the Marvel comics that they took it to a way deeper level than the cartoon did and once again uh, comics for the uh, cartoon were much deeper for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I was also a fan not at first but after a while of the cartoon itself and so I watched pretty much every incarnation of the Turtles since 87 and there's been several reboots and, 87 uh, reboots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my favorite uh, crossover episode actually happened, I think it was in 1999. They actually had one where the turtles went through different dimensions. And the turtles of that time met the 87 turtles who they thought were ridiculous and <laughs> met a much, much, much broodier comic versions who were black and white. And they all crossed over to defeat the shredder of their series. And actually, the shredder of that series met the 87 shredder was like, what are you? You're not even a bad guy. <laughs> so yeah, I've been a, to say I'm a turtle fan is putting it lightly. I mean, I even wanted to play the role playing game. If any of you guys remember, oh, that came dude, I, I was huge into the, the, the role playing game. Yeah. The RPG. Oh yeah. 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 I, I had all of like the, the, uh, additional like supplemental books, like, Oh, like the Australian, uh, yeah. mutants of the Yucatan. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> no, that's for real. That's yeah. for real. No, you could, like, of the Yucatan. I yeah. love it. Being able to make a, a mutant kangaroo and everything like that, it was like huge, man. Oh, yeah. That was just a cash making machine for that, for whoever had the, the rights to that at any given time. But, uh, yeah, for sure. Definitely yeah. outdid Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, as violent, I, though. I, I did play the, the Garfield RPG as well, too. <laughs> it's it mostly just napping and lasagna. Yeah. yeah. Lasagna plus random 10. People. Yeah. yeah, you have, getting, just have to, yeah, making lasagna, rolling, rolling dice, <laughs> getting back at normal. <laughs> so the story is set in the future, uh, and it concerns one of the teenage Mutant ninja turtles. All right, seeking wait, revenge. Real quick, anyone have any ideas who it was going to be at first? Uh, I Raph. couldn't tell. I thought I thought it was yeah. going to be Raphael because of the size and. Well, Raph has always been the toughest of all of them. And yeah. so I assumed it was going to be him. Like Leonardo seems like the type of guy who would throw himself on a bomb. The other, you know, are just Donatello. not as strong. Yeah, Donatello, Michelangelo just didn't seem as tough. Yeah. Spoiler, it turns out to be Michelangelo. I think that's going to add some gravitas because he was such a, like a clown character mm -hmm. to be the one that's kind of burdened with guilt and responsibility to seek revenge. Like the, um, the least equipped turtle to... To, to take on this responsibility is yeah. would be Michelangelo. Yeah. But yeah, it's set in the future. It's a very basic story is he's seeking revenge against Oroku Hiroto, uh, who's the grandson of the Shredder for the deaths of his brother about a decade before the story begins. And it's really like a cross. It's like it pulled, it borrows from so many different well-known stories. It's like a cross between old man Logan escape from New York and the dark Knight returns. Yeah, and in universe, like I mentioned before, it definitely seems to pull inspiration from the cartoon universe because when he's laying out much later the different eye masks, yeah. yeah, they're they're colored, which is not what the comic was traditionally. Yeah, and and then these sh uh, foot soldiers are obviously cyborgs slash robots, like they were in the cartoon, but much deadlier. 
So it, it, it definitely seems to pull from that universe more for inspiration. Although he does say, you know, he thought they were going to be ninjas and then he calls them sci- Sijas or something like that, Sinjas, because they're right. cyborg ninjas. And yeah, and there's like human, it's like Robocops. In fact, I think yeah. he makes a joke about that. Yeah, I thought, I was like, it's pretty dark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all these all these cops, it's like kind of a, a draconian, it's always in the future, it's always draconian, right. that there's so many cops though guarding this futuristic new york that's walled in that's kind of like and they even make a joke about one of the his brothers are present like in his mind he can hear him talking and one of them even calls him pliskin uh right yeah i thought that was a pretty good callback but yeah you know surprisingly enough being in such a dystopian future where they have pretty much control of everything and they're cyborgs these robocops are kind of chicken shits like they're scared almost all the time when they meet him. Like, I thought they would be surprised maybe, but they seem to be scared to actually face him. So I was I, w- but, I was a little surprised by that. But in keeping with tradition of henchmen, both like in cartoon or like in Star Wars, they're not very competent for being cyborg ninjas. He easily beats the shit out of multiple robots at a time. Yeah, I think there's the one line where he says something like, they have skill, but no... Not fortitude, but just they're they're lacking conviction, basically. Yeah. Right. Uh, I will also point out that what was a little weird about this city is that it wasn't well protected, as he points out in the beginning. It's the walls are more there to keep people in than out. But they're also a city of flying cars. So I'm thinking, wouldn't you have much taller walls if you have flying <laughs> cars? I mean, the flying cars just have to have an accident and accidentally roll over. And they'd be over the fence. Well, maybe they've I, got like a little locking system, like on oh, shopping carts. Oh, yeah. Like know, a height guard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Yeah, as you try to go, it just locks the car up. and <laughs> It, it locks the, the wheels of the flying car. So you can't, right. you can't go because <laughs> the wheels aren't turning. And honestly, <laughs> if you have that much control over the city, wouldn't you just put more money into the infrastructure and have better public transit so people don't independently fly around? Like they're just always... In your Dictators <laughs> don't concern themselves with that. As, as we've seen, I was going to make a Trump joke. No. <laughs> Autocrats <laughs> don't take the bus. Yeah. There's right. no, there's no, they don't need the infrastructure to be uh, right. intact or maintained or updated. But it's, it's a really basic story. I mean, he just, the whole mm-hmm. issue, because we, we read issue one. I don't, at, at the time we're recording this, I don't even think issue two is out yet, right? I think it's been delayed a couple of times because actually it, it took me a little, I had to go to multiple comic shops to grab a copy of this. And even the ones that I got, it was apparently they released like a ton of variant covers. I ended up getting one of the, 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 the pricier variants, but <laughs> it, it, so still happy with it, but it, it definitely uh, took some, some tracking down, but I, I think it's actually supposed to be out pretty soon. And this being the, Second week of January. Yeah, when we're recording this early. Do we January. know how many max es- max issues are supposed to come out? I think it's four. Oh, okay, but yeah, it's a pretty straightforward story. He he goes in, tries to, he's basically trying to get revenge against Shredder's grandson. Fails, gets pretty messed up. He falls right before he's about to like get revenge. He falls and is, may die. I mean, I'm in there. He's not going to die because I have to continue the story, but. He gets pretty banged up, and then there's a kind of a a secret. There's a woman that helps him who has purple hair, and and is that a spoiler? At the very end, he winds up in some sewer with April O'Neil helping him recover. But was that woman in the purple hair? Was that April, or was no. that a different character? Different she, character. Yeah, and she, that he stole her bike originally, which was weird. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and then that that's another thing that makes me see that this is more connected to the cartoon universe. April O'Neil in the comics looked very different. She she in fact looked a lot like Eastman's wife, who who he would eventually marry. I forgot her name. I think she was a, a penthouse pet. But she oh, had, really? Yeah, she had more curly hair. It wasn't red. And so this looking much older April O'Neil is pretty much the cartoon version aged up and old Loganed up. So it, this is definitely more connected to the cartoon universe, which makes sense. You know, they're probably understanding that most people, 
their connection to the Mutant Ninja Turtles was the cartoon itself, maybe other cartoons, and then, you know, maybe the later comics. But for most part, the 87 cartoon is so iconic that they, they made this more of a connection. Julia Strain. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Heavy Metal 2000. That's right. Heavy <laughs> Metal 2000, Penthouse, Pet of, I don't remember, 82 or something. <laughs> That's what teenage mutant, teenage mutant ninja turtle money gets you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As 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 far as the story was concerned, it was pretty basic, and but I, I was still it was very enjoyable. Like it just it, it, the intro was just a whole action action scene the entire way through, and it kept me entertained. And he's got all the brothers' gear. He's got Raphael's size. He's got Leonardo's swords and Donatello's bow staff. Is that like that in the original comics? Did they, was each turtle kind of beholden to one weapon or were they interchangeable? No, they had mainly swords from what I remember. Oh, okay. And then that might have changed later on, but like, and the equipment that he does have isn't necessarily in perfect condition. If I remember, Leonardo's sword is like busted. It's like basically half yeah. a sword. <laughs> and he almost, he was going to commit because he, fell and is so severely injured thinks he's gonna end he's almost gonna commit a uh, seppuku mm-hmm. uh with that broken sword but he winds up not doing it at the last he passes out he's, right but yeah his sword's all busted up and he's kind of yeah you're right it is more behind the cartoon because he's also got donatello's like science goggles mm-hmm. on around his neck too i wonder what the choice was i would yeah i wonder what i'm curious why they tied it in like that Oh, another big difference from the comic to the cartoon, which we'll see if they ever mention it in this one, is that in the comic, Splinter was a mutated rat, whereas in the cartoon, it was a human sensei who then somehow got some rat DNA in him and then got mutated. Yeah, I'm curious. I wonder if they did it because they think more people are familiar with. I imagine there's a there's a resurgence with the 80s. Well, but also I think that for for me, I mean, my image, you know, for for good or bad, is the you know the eighty seven cartoon version with the the ripping theme song, and, and to me that that's the turtles, you know, and maybe because you know you have the original guys, the Eastman and Laird, you know, team coming back to this, that nostalgia or. I don't know, memories of, of what it was kind of has now become, that is what the turtles are. Like, mm. you know, all of, all of these new iterations of the, you know, the turtles, I'm like, great, I'm good that they're, you know, continuing on. But, you know, Michelangelo is a, is a party dude. Uh, you know, Donatello's the science guy, you know, Leonardo's the dork and, you know, Raph is the, the malcontent, you know, that's, that, that I don't know. Uh-huh. That that's so imprinted on me that I you know that's kind of like stick. how the Star Wars series has ultimately become the stronger final trilogy as opposed to the weaker original trilogy. <laughs> oh, and I will correct myself. They didn't have distinctive weapons before. They didn't have distinctive masks, but they did have one. One of them was you know using size. One was using nunchucks. Except. In the original comic book, or yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. But and, and and honestly, to jump off what Jake was saying, to make this m- tied to the cartoon is actually more interesting because they were so goofy and so lighthearted that to see them take this dark path is more interesting than before, which they were already dark. So that's like Batman going darker. Eh, you know, uh, that's not much of but- a jump. <laughs> but if it was like Batman 66 and then right. 30 years later, it <laughs> right. was like a dark brooding Adam West Batman. Exactly. Like, Whoa. Exactly. Dude, I would, I would watch the hell out of a brooding dark Adam West Adam Batman. West Batman. Yeah. Why haven't they done that? You know, that's actually <laughs> a great question. Why haven't, because they've done Batman 66 comics and they've done other things like that, where they've done like a Wonder Woman 66 that ties into the Batman 66. Why haven't they done a, Let's jump in the future and make the Dark Knight, but with Batman 66. Oh, and see come on. How, hey, how that play out? <laughs> I'm, I'm calling on you, Internet. Do this for me, please. Yeah. Right now. But like it's it's still uh, the Dark the Dark Knight Returns. Right. Uh, yeah. But instead of like that 
the the gray motif, the gray and black motif. It's the purple and lavender. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody should do that. Someone needs to do a parody Uh, Dark Knight Returns Batman 66 crossover. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be fucking awesome. Done in the style (laughs) of the Dark Knight Returns. Right. (laughs) Like Caesar Caesar Romero Batman. With his mustache (laughs) painted over. (laughs) (laughs) That's how you knew that was just a job. I don't know. Maybe maybe throw in Christopher Reeve, Superman. (laughs) I like to see what the Batman 66 armor suit would look like. (laughs) Like people would just laugh. It was like like when uh, Austin Powers came out of being frozen. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, he's still dressed that way. Like he shows up like that. People are like, Batman, you're not intimidating at all. <laughs> Dick Grayson, where he's got the little bikini briefs. Exactly. He's like old and gross and like rubbery. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's just spilling out the bottom. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Dennis, what would you think? What are your final thoughts on the book? Uh, absolutely loved it. Very strong first issue. <clears throat> Looking forward to the other three. Jake? Even uh, if I just went on like the nostalgia factor, I would be all on board. But basic story, but definitely entertaining all throughout. And I, I have to get this in there. You know, Matt, I'm really sorry. We won't be able to use that because it's copyrighted. Oh, uh, all right. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could see the the uh, TMNT Empire having uh, deep pockets and a very litigious. So I, I understand. <laughs> I, I, I'm still learning. But yeah, I mean, I mean, also another point that re-emphasized the the cartoon for me was not the Nintendo game, but the arcade uh, quarter oh, eater sure. button mm-hmm. masher. I mean, as a kid, I was I probably put hundreds. I mean, like literally hundreds of dollars into that that machine, and so yeah, it, it was entertaining. I I wasn't surprised to see the fact that I did have to kind of search for it because of how excited people were to see that that was that was kind of interesting and you know fun to to see and i'm glad i got got my copy of it hopefully uh issue two will be a little bit easier to pick up but yeah definitely picking it up i also forgot the the stockman robots showed oh, the up mousers oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's that was only in the cartoons right Wasn't no the, in- they appeared in the uh, comic as well and virtually the same design too oh okay all right as for myself not being like a super turtles person, I I wasn't really compelled to. Read the, I don't care. To, like if we read the other issues for this, I'll read them. But otherwise, I'm I'm not gonna read them. Wasn't really didn't do anything for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they haven't released any of the others. I called up right. Eastman and there, and I was like, "Look, guys, you're circle jerking it for your own fan base." No, no. Well, they, they, they were crunching the numbers and they were like, okay, all we need is one more issue to sell <laughs> to Johnny Flores and we're done. We got, we got issue two out. And there's we need, that, we need <laughs> that GNEC money coming in. So. Right. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm glad you guys liked it as, as a uh, turtle fans. I'm glad it scratched that <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah. Definitely checked a lot of turtle boxes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Oh, I forgot. Almost. I I missed this part. Where can uh, people follow us if they want to do that? They can totally find us on Twitter or Instagram at GN Explorers Club. Cool. Thanks for listening. Uh, We'll be back in two weeks. Later, dudes.